You are now tuned into the Leaders Lens Podcast. And we are back here at the Leaders Lens Podcast. I've been excited to record this episode for a while. We are here with founder and CEO of Acquire, Andrew Gazdecki. Formerly Micro Acquire, but they have helped 200,000 plus founders and buyers do business together, buying and selling SaaS products. Andrew, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Jacob, thanks so much for, for having me on my on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm passionate about leadership. I always love your message of the attention to culture and how important it is to drive business results. And I've been, been excited to dig in a little deeper to, to understand your perspective and what you've learned in your, your journey as a leader. So definitely grateful, grateful for the time. And hopefully, you know, we'll get that at acquire from Twitter at some point as well. That's been a, that's been a fun fight to watch as well. It's, it's my, my guilty pleasure. Just fucking, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up, grew up being told the answer is always no unless you ask so i'll just keep asking there you go i'd love to hear about your leadership journey where, where did you develop leadership skills were you working with coaches were you just learning through trial and error reading reading different books or what did your development look like as you developed in this role as a founder wow what a great question to start this podcast um so i'll tell you a story um the answer is learned for sure and the role of the CEO is weird because there's no job. Like, let's say you're a VP of sales. Before that, you were SDR, you are an AE, maybe you got to a manager, then you're a direct, you're learning along the whole way. Yeah. But then when you start a company, you're just CEO, you're in charge of everything, culture, uh, management. And um, I started that journey at uh, when I was 21. Um, uh, started a business, grew to, let's call it, uh, I don't know, 5 million in the first three years or something like that. It was like a rocket ship. It was like, a, what did I do? I have no, it, it, and to give you more context, it was a, um, do it yourself, um, drag and drop mobile app builder. So kind of right place, right time business. But my point being is, um, it, it was, it was, a, it was a business that grew quickly. And so, I hired quickly, um, and it was bootstrapped. So, um, every hire that we made was, was incremental. And we always had this saying only hire when it hurts. So, um, I eventually got, um, into this peer CEO group called 10 X CEO. And okay. I remember, <laughs> I always remember this and, uh, I wasn't doing any one-on-ones with any of my you know, VPs or anything like that. And I didn't even know what the concept of a one-on-one -on -one was because I had never worked anywhere. I had never worked at another company. I'd never seen the inside of another, like, I didn't know how a good business was ran. So um, it was learned. Um, and also I had really good mentorship too. So I got to give a shout out to um, specifically Tim Porthouse. Um, He's um, always been my CEO coach. And then also Christian Friedland. He was my mentor through um, my first startup, um, which was called uh, Business Apps, if I didn't mention that. And he had built a ginormous company. He built a company called build.com. It's like, it's like Home Depot online. So uh, just was really fortunate to be surrounded by really just great leaders. And I think that's really actually that is what influenced um and then i read books and like i wanted to be a good boss or leader or however you want to describe it uh but it was definitely um tim porthouse and, and christian Friedman. those two, those two individuals taught me a lot i love it. and you, t you mentioned the one-on-ones that you added that after you joined this group and you kind of started to see the impact behind it do you remember some of the other low hanging fruit that you immediately implemented that now seem obvious, maybe at the time just weren't in your hinds weren't in your purview? Hire people smarter than me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got another story for you. Cause I was so young. Uh, I remember I didn't come from a lot of money too. So big salaries. I was like, are you crazy? 
Um, I remember specifically, and you know, Tim and Christian helped me work through this one, but we needed a VP of marketing because I was handling all marketing, um, passed down product to uh, basically one of my buddies, but he grew into a world-class uh, product manager and he's now VP of product at um, Acquire. Uh, and, um, we were, we were interviewing people and they're, they were like, I want a 150,000. I was paying myself like 50,000 or something like that. Just enough to 30,000 enough to just pay rent. And I was like, that's crazy. I'll just do your job and save the money. Like no way. But in hindsight, you know, every smart person, if, if they perform within the business and you create an environment for them to succeed you see a substantial return on investment. And so I had that mindset all wrong. I looked at it as 150K cost rather than, well, this person could potentially help grow the business by an extra million a year or accelerate what we're already doing. Or uh, actually we even, <laughs> I can't even make this up. Um, so when we finally did make a hire, um, can I keep going? Do you want to hear the story? Please go on. I love this. Yeah, this is great. This is, this is my biggest mistake. So we call this the era of blowing up a Ferrari every single month. So we had a um, uh, $100,000 a month um, Google ad campaign. And everything was working at the company. So it was kind of a state of don't touch anything. We don't know anything. And we don't know what's where our leads are coming from. We, you know, Google ads, we were doing SEO, we we're um, in every publication, um, you know. And so long story short, we finally make the hire. He comes in. The first thing we ask is like, hey, can you tell us like what our return on um, Google ad spend is? And he's like, you're losing 95% of what you're spending. So every single month we were basically just throwing away $90,000 and then also you got to factor in our, my team's cost to call the leads, to disqualify them. Uh, so that, that was a hard lesson. And I think, oddly enough, blowing up a Ferrari every month probably would have been a better marketing strategy than <laughs> that one. That's had. great content. I'd give it away to, to a, a, a customer every month. Yeah, let's, or, or just have a Ferrari. Like, gosh, <laughs> that one kills me. But, I mean, you live and you learn. That's beautiful. So what were the things that you did differently as you decided, I'm going to build this new company. Now it's called Acquire. I want to set a, a foundation. You know, you're thinking about culture at this point, it sounds like. Like, what are the things that you, you did differently to set this one up for success? So I, I, I'd like to think culture is one thing I always got right at Business Apps, my first startup. I always kind of viewed culture as, you know, people remember how you made them feel. And so I always wanted people to feel appreciated. I wanted to have people feel heard, that they had a voice, that they were making an impact. So we did a lot of promotion from within. Um, and we also had a lot of fun too. We had, you know, quarterly, you know, events, um, you know, Friday happy hours. Um, so I, I tried to create, you know, really enjoyable work environment that was both, both challenging and like work hard play hard you know a bunch of 25 year olds what do you think is gonna happen <laughs> uh but uh so fast forward to acquire you know i really i i started off with fixing all of the mistakes because the mistakes that you make in business you don't forget them the big ones you do not and you and repeating those mistakes is like you just want to like bang your head on the wall like why, why did I do that I already made that mistake <laughs> so uh you know I brought my CEO coach back um and uh rehired all of my VPs to start so usually you hire individual contributors to start but I wanted that that core foundation of my previous company's culture um so I started by uh rebuilding my team by just hiring back the people that I trusted and I knew were um, compatible with my working style and were, were talent, really talented individuals. Um, so fix the first mistake of not hiring people smarter than me 
uh, fast enough. It was the first thing I did. First thing I did, I was like, I don't know anything about product. Steven, you go deal with it. I don't know anything about engineering. Dave, you go deal with it. Um, I don't know anything about like uh, documenting like a sales process, or I do, but um, you know, Rosa, go. This is this is yours now. Like mass delegation um, was was probably the first you know, big, big shift in towards of correcting mistakes I'd made in the past. Love that. So you, and you had the trust already established with this group as well. So there wasn't that like insecurity of like, are they going to be able to do this job? Because this is a group that you already had that kind of foundation set with. Yeah. I think that's a huge, huge advantage of um, being a sec second time founder. If you're not an asshole, it's a caveat. <laughs> um, yeah, no, wanna, that's a great point. For you again. And these hires were made, or I should say they joined the team, really, um, during COVID, too. So you don't get to meet the person. You don't get to. And with roles like this, like VP of product, VP of engineering, CFO, they're such impactful roles. And if you get them wrong, it sets you back so far. Because you're essentially hiring the leaders um, within your business, and so, yeah, that's kind of like a, a advantage. If even if you just work somewhere else um, and you have a network and you can hire people that you know that you work well together, they're excited, you're excited, um, and then it just makes work fun too. Hundred percent. I love the uh, that you call out that benefit of not being an asshole because I do feel like sometimes like the culture is kind of looked at like as a fluffy thing. Like it's not really a benefit. It's something that people talk about, but a lot of, I, I feel like a lot of business owners have the perspective of like, that makes me look soft and weak and that's not what I need to be as a leader. But you bring up a great point that like people just wanting to work with you is a huge competitive advantage, especially with how competitive the, uh, the workforce has been recently and the employee retention has been so challenging um, it sounds like you haven't really experienced a lot of those issues. And my assumption is that's a direct correlation to the culture that you create. Yeah. I mean, I think the cost to replace an employee is, uh, I believe there's some stat out there, but I don't know, just assume it's like half their salary. So c because you lose productivity when they leave and then you got to spend time recruiting. So now your focus is changed or moved away and then you need to onboard that person and then they need to start adding value and then they need to work out and so you retention of we talk a lot about a, a retention of customers but i always i think way more about retention of employees um because when if you're just losing employees left and right you can never really build a really anything your team is everything um, I don't know where I'm really going with that point, uh, but no, it's great. I think the other thing that to add to that conversation is when you lose an employee, it adds stress to everybody else on the team. And if the culture is already stressed, people are already dissatisfied in the work with their work. It almost just gives them another reason to leave. And I, I've seen this downward spiral happen where like people just start leaving in masses and it just, it adds on, you know, it just, it, it goes the wrong direction fast, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, I, another thought on that too is, and I've I've seen this in a number number of businesses where you're you're unintentionally building a burnout factory, where yes. you're there's just so much work to do, but you're not staffing your business correctly, and some people will tell you, some people will say, hey, I'm burnt out, or hey, like I can't take on this much work, um, and if you hear that, you should listen. Because what they're really saying is, I'm going to leave. This isn't sustainable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have like unlimited PTO at um, Acquire. We, um, you know, we're you know, very lax in terms of, I wouldn't say lax, but um, I, there's a lot of companies that have unlimited PTO and it's like a bad thing and you, yeah. know, you have this culture where no one takes any days off because they might get fired. Like, my team takes days off all the time. Like, um, uh, someone's off in Hawaii right now, and I just talked to her, and I just, uh, you know, just said, I hope you enjoy your, your vacation. Um, but my point there is, um, you know, 
you want to have an environment where people, you know, they they obviously do really high impactful work, but they also take time off because they're not built like you as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are kind of weird. They're uh, I always call them a group of crazies um, because we'll work like hundred hour weeks and when we go on vacation, we want to get back so we can work. Um, but your team isn't like that. And so you need to understand that and you need to understand what motivates them personally and professionally. And your dream isn't their dream. So encourage them to take that vacation, encourage them to go to that conference they want to go to encourage them to make a side project or something like that. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's a two-way street where, you know, if they're helping you achieve your dream, you know, I think you should equally support their dream, whether that's work-life balance or that's learning new skill sets or, you know, starting a company on the side. Absolutely. I feel like you're going to have like 10 people want to apply to work at Acquire after listening to this podcast, after hearing that, because I think this, this is the environment people want to be part of. What are some of the other things that you do to maintain culture as your, your team grows, as the business grows, as demand kind of piles on as far as what the expectations are? How do you, how do you keep it a good place to work? Yeah, so as it grows, um, you, you know, that's where, you know, processes, um, you know, really, you know, you can say like processes, systems, SOPs, SLAs, all those things start to really become, you know, important. But really, it just comes down to, you know, expectations. Like, hey, this is the clear expectation. This is what proficient looks like. And this is what exceptional looks like. And so we expect exceptional here. And so the way that works is when, you're, when your team starts to grow, especially when you're remote, you definitely you need to get together at least once a quarter for, you know, quarterly offsites. Um, you can make this super fun, review the progress of the quarter. Um, but one exercise that really helps um, for each department is as a team, like I'll give an example. So recently um, with our, our sales and support team, um, we went over um, five pillars. Um, I can't remember each distinct one, but we, ha we went around, all, all of us, and we just put a sticky note on a whiteboard. And one column was proficient. One was exceptional. So it'd be customer calls in angry. What do we do? What's proficient? So an example there would be calmed them down. And then exceptional would be calmed them down, suggested another solution, took responsibility for the issue, um, left them you know, in a better state than when they called in, just as, as, as an example. And so what you're doing is you're, you know, when you think of culture, you don't want to just say, hey, these are my expectations and you're going to do them. Another way to think about it is, hey, let's all talk about the commitments we want to make as a company. How, what is exceptional to all of us as a group? Let's agree on it. And when you get that buy in as a group, it's a little, it's a little different, you know, because it's not me saying, hey that's exceptional. It's the whole team saying that's exceptional. That's proficient. We want to be exceptional. And so that exercise has always been fun. I love it. And it's a great tool for the leader as well to learn about how their employees and their teams see the business. Like what are the gaps, what's going well and the, the why behind it, the specific details you get from it also. I love that activity. That's a great one. Can you tell us a, a time where you had to adjust the culture in response to something that happened? Yeah, actually, I got a good one on this one. Um, okay, so we were in um, San Francisco for my first business, and we were, we were bootstrapped. So we were, you know, we were we were growing, we were profitable, but by no means were we on track to go public. We had no interest in raising venture capital. Um, so the culture there, comparative to other businesses, you know, we had employees that you know maybe their roommate worked at Salesforce. Sales, I would literally get these questions like, why don't we have like dry cleaning? And I'm just like, huh? Like, <laughs> I, like yeah. we're not Salesforce. Um, <laughs> you know, we're not Google. Like, yeah. like 
do you, you know like i wish <laughs> i could provide dry cleaning as a that was actually something someone asked um like my friend has dry cleaning out there work why don't we um so there i think there being a bootstrap company in san, san francisco you know with everyone located there fully in office there was a culture mismatch and so people's expectations of what it was to work at a um you know startup tech company whatever you want to call it um was was out of line with um really the, just the reality of our business we, we couldn't af afford those perks and so that created a little bit of a culture of um uh what's the right word here uh maybe maybe a tad entitled so um uh like for example like um so long, I'll, I'll kind of speed up the story. We ended up moving the company to San Diego and I hired on a um, chief customer success officer, basically basically a COO. And uh, she interviewed um, some people on our support team and asked, what's your least favorite part about your job? And across the board, they all said, answering the phone. And <laughs> she comes to me and she's like, yeah, I don't think it's going to work because uh, that's their job. And so we'd have like the servers go down and stuff and then no one answers the phone and they're just going off because they know if they answer it, you know, their job is to, and it's yeah. a hard, support's a hard job, so I understand. For sure. But um, I specifically moved my company. I actually, there's a, a blog post I wrote about it, if anybody's listening to this. Just type in um, TechCrunch, Andrew Gazdecki, San Diego. And I uh, wrote a guest piece in TechCrunch about how I moved the company, why I moved the company. Um, and a big reason was, you know, we were just like this little fish in this pond of, you know, juggernaut uh, venture back businesses. So yeah, uh, that, that was, yeah, that, that was actually like a full, um, you know, company reset and it, it couldn't have worked out better. Yeah. So how did you handle that dynamic of, the entire team of customer support like we don't want to do this because it's hard but that's what, what they were hired for yeah i mean it's difficult because you don't want to be the person that's just screaming at people all the time so we we would have expectations um but there gets to a point where you know when certain individuals don't want to do certain things then it becomes kind of the norm within the culture and then it's just, it's really hard to reverse that because, you know, you kind of got it like your, this is your job and you're just not doing it. And so, um, everyone I worked with in San Francisco was fantastic, but what we ended up doing was essentially letting the entire customer service team go that was based in, in San Francisco and we did it overlap. So we kept them on mm -hmm. for as long as they wanted to, uh, but they were working from home before people liked working from home. So they hated it. Gotcha. Um, so they would eventually kind of tail off. Um, so we would just say, Hey, if you don't like answering the phones, let's put you on email support. If you don't like the phones, um, we'll put you on, you know, customer success calls. Those are a little bit more pleasant. Um, and as that happened, we kept hiring in from San Diego. So we eventually just sort of slowly replaced the team. We didn't, when I, I should clarify, when we moved the company, we didn't fire anybody. We didn't just clear out the like hey we're out we yeah you know slowly kind of replace you know the culture with um and i have to give full credit to um you know really rosa romaine for helping me with this transition um because she brought in the expectation she i've i've actually actually learned a lot about culture um from her and leadership and management um she really helped build a, a team that was exceptional and not just proficient I love that. And it sounds like what I'm hearing is like their approach was let's find a solution that works for everybody. We'll find something that still helps the company, but allows you to do more of the things that you're enjoying in the role. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to find that balance because we might look at it like people are going to take advantage of us if we give in a little bit. But in the reality, I think generally, you know, people are more motivated to do their work when they feel like they're working for somebody that's trying at least to find a way to accommodate their requests. Yeah, I would I would completely agree. I mean, no one wants a boss that just is, you know, micromanaging them or, um, 
you know, I, I also like to, you know, lead from the front. So if there's ever an issue, like the reason I was late for this podcast was there was, um, someone on our support team had a question and I jumped in to handle it. And then I came back down here. So, um, and when I say like, I, 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 I was working upstairs and I like, literally came down here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's powerful when, you know, you are, you're there to support your team as well. Like, again, what do you like, where, where do you, where do you see yourself fitting best within the organization? And it's, you know, I think the leader's job to, you know, be, uh, really influential in that obviously, because, you know, you need the job filled, but also kind of hear their feedback. Like what, what do you think we could be doing better? Um, uh, really outlining what success looks like for them. So that they have an understanding because sometimes you have teams where they may be doing a terrible job. And as a CEO, you're just like, Oh, they're that those, that team is really bad, but expectations haven't been set or, um, you know, you're, you're wondering why no one cares that the company's growing because their comp isn't tied to performance. Uh, so even just little changes like that really gets everybody on the same page. Alignment, team alignment is also a big, big, big part of culture in terms of under understanding strategy, um, being rewarded for doing the right things. Um, and then also having clear expectations about, am I doing a good job or am I not doing a good job? So giving people also just the comfort of knowing where they stand with you at all times is something I've always tried to do. I love it. No, because if we don't connect those dots, people connect those dots themselves. And sometimes they do it incorrectly. They start making up stories that aren't true. They might feel like one conversation is a reflection of how you feel about the entire body of their work. So I love that. Just being clear on this is what success looks like in this company and in your role specifically, but then also just making sure we're actively and transparently communicating as things are going well, but also as there are gaps. So there isn't confusion on, on what's happening exactly and and if you're not good at those things hire someone to come be you know like most founders are builders and like you know building a, a builders a build you know yeah but then also scalar scale you know so you <laughs> the scale is totally different it's it's very it's 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 a lot of people management it's a lot of uh you know clear clear goals with you know what score are we trying to hit every month? Um, again, what is proficient? What's exceptional? What, is, what are the expectations? And without those, you kind of get this culture that is kind of made up, um, in my opinion. I love it. So if we had to condense this into a few bullet points and we're working with a found, talking to a founder or a manager that's never led a team before, they're brand new, they want to do well, but they're just a little uncertain, to, uh, a little uncertain on, on how to approach their role as a leader. What's the advice you'd, you'd give to them? Well, the first thing is understanding that, you know, uh, your job isn't, or let me put it this way. So just understanding at, at a basic level, you work for your team, not the other way around. So you do everything you can to make sure that they have everything they need to be successful. They enjoy the work that they are working on um, and they enjoy the people that they work with. If you get those three basic things right, you're gonna have a, a pretty good culture. And then there's layers below each of those points I could, I could go on, but if I could just say three things, I'd say, you know, have candid conversations with each person that you bring on your team and have clear expectations on, hey, this is what success looks like. Um, and then in your opinion, what is proficient? What is um, exceptional? Um, and have those conversations early so people really understand what is the strategy? How do I succeed here? Um, and then also just make it an enjoyable place where you know, you're not forcing people back in the office if they can't <laughs> clearly make it, you know? So there's it. also just some like simple things like, you know, don't, don't be an asshole and uh, say, thank you. Like that's another just huge simple one that I, I think people 
just don't understand just just thank every single day in slack i have this it's super cheesy but i do a daily appreciation or you know just someone on the team i go daily appreciation has like two fire emojis and i say the person's name and something that they did that was awesome um and i'm pretty sure i have like a 170 day streak of doing i do it every day that's and awesome I, even tell the, I tell the team i'm like i know this is cheesy but i'm, I'm gonna keep going so just no, i love it showing, I mean, what were you saying i was gonna say recognition i think is just a great way to make sure the things that the actions we want are repeated like it's just some such a simple tactic we see something that we want people to keep doing like just take a moment to recognize that it happened and and talking about about the impacts so i love that you have that as a, a daily habit in your in your network yeah and another thing i'd add is um just make work fun like we do this thing that makes no sense but i'll tell you anyways um we have these awards that we give out at the end of each quarter to a standout in product marketing sales operations um, and then i have a ceo award that i give out and it's a plastic banana <laughs> we call it the banana awards and uh the, the it just i thought it was funny when i was in my 20s and i carried it over into my 30s <laughs> but what happens is if you get one banana i buy you lunch for a week if you get two bananas you get 500 bucks and if you get three bananas you get a, fl- a plane flight to anywhere in the world let's so, go okay yeah the first time someone cashed in three bananas he booked a first class flight to japan so we had to put some terms of service on those after that <laughs> uh yeah it's just like those are rules um but uh yeah um, my point is like just make work fun because you got to work there too and if you if you create this job that you hate and you just you know you, you're in these meetings and they feel tense and it's just you know there's misalignment people are arguing like that's gonna weigh on you as a leader and the company will not succeed if if you can't enjoy the company as well so facts i love it andrew your friends call you gaz you said hopefully i can call you gaz but we appreciate you being here on the leaders lens podcast i know our audience will take a ton of value from hearing you talk about leadership so thank you yeah my pleasure jacob thanks for having me on Thank <laughs> you.